Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm Eric. As uh, was said, I'm, I'm a fifth year PhD student at MIT. Um, and I'm going to talk about a paper I put on the archive last month on local minima in VQE and other variational algorithms. Um, so just to make sure we're all on the same page, first I'll talk about uh, variational algorithms in general um, and what properties uh, are important for their trainability and what we've seen numerically that up until now we hadn't really understood analytically. And then I'll talk about the closest analogous uh, framework in uh, the classical literature, and in, in particular classical machine learning lost landscapes. <clears throat> and I'll talk about how great their lost landscapes are where they always find the global minimum essentially. Um, and then I'll talk about how bad VQE can be uh, and just give a very, <clears throat> sorry, a very high level overview of uh, the proof techniques I used, okay? And then I'll corroborate it with numerical experiments. Okay, so let me, let me talk about VQE to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so you've probably all seen this slide in some variation of it a thousand times, but here it is again. Uh, we're in this NISC era of quantum computers where we have these noisy uh, intermediate scale or small uh, quantum devices that are beginning to do things that classical computers can't simulate. So most famously, a couple of years ago, uh, Google's Sycamore device did random circuit sampling. Um, but really, they haven't really demonstrated anything useful that they can do that a classical computer can't do. So really, that's like you know the big open question. Is there anything useful that these computers can do? Or some uh, like extension in five to 10 years? Uh, is there anything interesting they can do? So really, the best uh, possibility that people have come up with are these variational quantum algorithms. So um, essentially, they're primarily motivated by the fact that your quantum computer has very bad coherence time. So you want to minimize the quantum computations you're doing. So what do you do? You phrase whatever problem you're interested in as a ground state problem. So we have some uh, Hamiltonian H, and we're interested in finding the ground state. And then depending on uh, how noisy our architecture is and how many qubits or whatever, we have a class of trial states, so ansatzes theta. Um, and then we just minimize this loss function, which is minimized when this is the ground state, assuming it's expressive enough. OK? And uh, generally, these ansatzes fall into one of two classes. Um, there are Hamiltonian agnostic ansatzes. So if you've heard of the hardware efficient ansatz, um, if you've heard things about VQE before, these are ansatzes that are independent of your problem. And they're almost completely motivated by the fact that you have a certain quantum computer with a certain architecture and you want to have as large a depth as possible on this architecture. Um, on the other hand, there are these Hamiltonian dependent ansatzes. And these are things like uh, unitary coupled cluster or QAOA, if you've heard these terms. Um, and here, your ansatz is composed of, for instance, rotations under terms in your Hamiltonian. So uh, usually it's costlier to implement, but uh, it's a lot more physically motivated because it actually depends on your problem, um, whereas Hamiltonian agnostic circuits are completely independent of your problem. OK? And obviously, um, the performance of this algorithm heavily depends on how easy this loss function is to optimize. Because we've essentially pushed all questions of complexity into optimizing this loss function and how difficult this trial state is to prepare. Um, so yeah, understanding the loss surface of BQE is very important. So uh, let me talk about what people have analytically seen prior to this. Um, essentially what people have seen are Barron plateau results. So um, the, the way I like to picture these results uh, is that for deep Hamiltonian agnostic circuits, the loss landscape looks like the surface of Tatooine. So if we're doing some maximization problem, um, if we start 
near the vicinity in the vicinity of a the global maximum we can optimize because it's very sharply peaked. But if we start at a random point in the lost landscape, then it will be impossible to optimize essentially in any reasonable amount of time because this is so flat we don't really get any gradient information. So we have no idea where to go if we're out here. Um, so we have to start at a good spot, essentially. So really what this says is um, deep Hamiltonian agnostic uh, circuits are kind of infeasible to use. Um, and there are a bunch of variations of these results, but this is like the gist of it. Okay. Um, so that's that's the situation for deep variational ansatzes. Okay, what about shallow ansatzes? So prior to this, no one really understood them analytically, but at least numerically, people saw this phase transition in the quality of local minima um, with the depth of the circuit. So what do I mean by that? Um, essentially at low depth, um, when optimizing your variational loss function, you always get trapped in a local minimum. But then after some critical depth, all of your local minima are essentially at the global minimum and you can always optimize to like zero loss. Um, and generally there were two situations where people saw this phenomenon. Um, for Hamiltonian agnostic ansatzes, this seemed to happen at a depth exponential in the problem size. So uh, essentially, if you um, had any reasonable size of onsets, it would be impossible to optimize because all of your local minima are so far away from the global minimum. Um, and then for Hamiltonian-based onsets, they also saw this behavior, but at a depth that was much more reasonable. It was at like polynomial in the problem size um, or even smaller. Okay. So, uh, can just I ask you something. Yeah, yeah. So, by far here, do you mean far in parameter space or like in terms of the energy level? Wait, uh, sorry, say that again. Well, what do you mean by far? Do you mean like in terms of distance in? Parameters oh, in, in terms of energy. In terms of energy. Yeah. So let me show you an example. Thank you for the segue. Um, so, yeah, and this is the Kiani Lloyd and Métis paper. Um, so they're looking at optimizing Hamiltonian agnostic BQE. And when they have a number of parameters that's fewer than uh, two to the n, um, well, squared, then, so this is training time on the x-axis and this is loss, you always get stuck at a local minimum. So when training, you'll get stuck at a very high energy. But then as soon as you have a number of parameters, that's more than uh, this d squared, then you always find the global minimum. So it's a very interesting phase transition. And it's seen in a bunch of other situations. Um, so yeah, is there any questions about this phenomenon? Because I know it's a little weird. Um, and also I should say that the, the state they're preparing, um, they know it's express it's expressible by this uh, onsets that they're using. So it's not like an expressivity question. It's really like a training issue. Okay. Can, can, can there be two states that are, like in the over parameterized regime, can you be in a local minima that is very close in energy, but very far in parameter space? Yeah, for sure. So really this is um, uh, more an issue for VQE which is why I'll often say VQE instead of variational algorithms, um, because it, it really mainly applies to VQE where you're interested in, uh, well, sometimes you're interested in the ground state, but often you're interested in the uh, energy of your minimum. Um, and other places could apply is in generative modeling, uh, where you're interested in, um, like if you were to use a different loss function, it, it could be uh, interesting. But here we only analyze this like BQE kind of loss function. I see. Thanks, okay. Eric. Cool. So, right. Okay. We've seen these phase transitions uh, numerically. So, is there a way to understand them analytically? 
And if we understood them analytically, then we could design trainable onsatsus, hopefully, um, to avoid all these issues. Okay. So this is the setup. Any questions before I move on to some more background? Okay. Cool. So now let me talk about um, the situation in classical machine learning. So. Uh, Classical machine learning has it really nice, and it's kind of a miracle of classical machine learning that you can have these very complicated loss functions that essentially always, when you optimize, you find the global minimum. Uh, and so whatever model you prepare is the model you want to find. Um, so what's an example of this? Um, so this Tromanska paper um, looks at uh, essentially large classifiers. So these are not even that deep, just many parameters. Um, and they find both analytically and numerically that as you add parameters to the model, your uh, the quality of local minima improve essentially monotonically. So here's a histogram of local minima um, at different model sizes. And you can see essentially monotonically with the size of the model. Um, the quality improves. Uh, and, and it's not even like that many parameters um, in terms of machine learning. So you can see that, well, people have shown that at a rate root p, so if you have p parameters, at a rate root p, these local minima converge to the global minimum. So um, essentially, the more parameters you have, the better you are monotonically. OK. Um, so how do they show this? It's essentially a two-step process. First, they show that their neural network loss function can be expressed as a uh, random field. So what's a random field? It's essentially a random function on the space of parameters, so these w. And we're going to assume that the parameters, well, in the machine learning case, are normalized, so they live on a sphere. Uh, and they show that your loss function looks like this function, where J is a random Gaussian matrix. So it's drawn from this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, which is essentially, if you're unfamiliar with it, like random Gaussian Hermitian matrices. Um, okay? Or rather, symmetric matrices, or GOE. Uh, so they show that your loss function looks like this random field. And then once you have this nice mathematical object, you can use techniques from random matrix theory and Morse theory um, to look at what the critical point distribution looks like for, for this model. OK. So this is the general strategy that all of these, uh, I mean, there's a few variations uh, depending on the model, but this is the general strategy. So great, you could say, like, we have a complicated loss function. Let's just apply these results and show similar things. Um, and the answer is we can we can kind of do this, but we actually can't completely do it. And the reason is there are a few key differences between uh, variational algorithms and machine learning models. So um, first, uh, machine learning models are almost always nonlinear. And typically, these mappings, so you map uh, from your machine learning model to the random field. And this mapping relies on these nonlinearities um, to get this effective Gaussian coupling. OK? But for variational algorithms, everything is linear because it's quantum mechanics. So you don't have this. So we have to do some other things to get this random field. Um, that's the first difference. The bigger difference and the conceptually more interesting one, I think, is that uh, in, in VQE, your layers, so the unitaries you apply, are very underparameterized. So what do I mean by that? Um, so here is just a visualization of a, a linear neural network. So each layer, we apply a weight matrix. And the entries of that matrix are given by these lines. Um, and we directly vary the, the uh, 
strength of these neurons. So the strength of these entries of the matrix. Uh, and you can see that we're, we're directly parameterizing every neuron in this layer. But for variational algorithms, we have like a two to the n by a two to the n large unitary here. And then we parameterize time evolution under a single uh, permission op operator. So effectively, we have one parameter governing um, this whole weight matrix. Um, it's very underparameterized, especially because it's an exponentially large matrix. So this last point is the key difference um, between these two situations. Okay, are there any questions about these differences? Uh, Sorry, just in the sense of weights, basically you refer to the entries of the unitary, kind of? Uh, yeah, I mean, here, this is a very high level conceptual mm. way to think about it, but in a neural network, typically you're multiplying matrices with nonlinearities and you directly control every entry of that matrix when you're mm. training. In VQE, you're multiplying these exponentially large unitaries, um, but you only control one parameter for each matrix. Um, and that one parameter is, you know, your time evolving under some Hamiltonian and you're controlling mm. the time you evolve under it. So that's what I mean. We have one parameter for this exponentially large matrix versus directly controlling every parameter of the matrix. Um, and we'll find that this is the key difference in that leads to the bad lost landscapes. And in fact, this phase transition in the VQE case. Thanks. No problem. Any other questions? Sorry, like uh, maybe uh, it's trivial, but uh, why do you say like just one parameter, like, you know, controlling the, I mean, it could be possible, right? That, uh, uh, I mean, if I think about, you know, I mean, in a particular layer, I could have, you know, like uh, different parameters or I could have a same parameter, you know, like uh, in, in a layer and then corresponding to the same parameter, you know, like I could, I could have a, a unitary, like, uh, but uh, why can't I have, you know, like, uh, uh, like, uh, I mean, what do you mean by a unitary in a particular layer, you know, is that? Yeah, uh, yeah. so again, this is a very high level understanding. We'll get more technical in a second. Um, but I, I guess your question is, okay, why can't you uh, parameterize under multiple, like, uh, permission operators for a single unitary? Um, yeah, I and mean, so you can't. Yeah, so you, you can, and you can, I mean, as you say, like what you consider a layer is very arbitrary here, because this is, again, just a very conceptual understanding at this point. Um, but uh, the, the gist of it is if you have like polynomially many parameters, um, because you're like the dimension of this matrix, this circuit is two to the n by two to the n, um, unless you have two to the n parameters, it's going to be underparameterized in some way. Like you can't uniquely, you can't express all of these matrices, uh, all these possible unitaries with polynomially many parameters. So, so, so you know, like what I'm thinking that, uh, like, I mean, if we think about uh, uh, classical neural networks, like, uh, so they are basically what you have, you know, is a uh, function composition, like f of g of h of, you know, like, uh, Every yeah. uh, that's what you know it like, contributes to, and uh, and then like you know while while you are doing like uh, this composition, like you are adding you know like some degree of freedom there, like which corresponds to the weight in that particular layer. Uh, what you are suggesting that uh, here, I mean we don't have that kind of composition. I mean here we have just you know like more like a, a matrix unitary multiplication, but. Uh, mm -hmm. But then each of these unitaries, they are, you know, like the they correspond to a very large dimensional matrices. And uh, what you're suggesting that uh, just the fact that the, uh, the underlying matrices which are getting multiplied, they are very large objects. Uh, that's what leads to the key difference between the two cases. Yeah, essentially. Um, and again, at this point, like th this isn't obvious. This is just the uh, my conceptual understanding of what proof will come later. So, you know, this. I see. Essentially, so, you know, like, I, 
sorry, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, because I think this is a very cr uh, cr uh, critical point, like, you know, I mean, uh, of, of this talk. So, so I'm trying to, you know, like think of like, you know, and I, I probably you will explain it later also, but like yeah. some, some more papers came right recently, like uh, I think one from Shoddy Wu, like uh, from Maryland, where mm -hmm. they were, I think, uh, I didn't look at it in detail, but they said that the, the, cr the critical difference is that, you know, in the, in the quantum case, the, the presence of this uh, interference basically uh, makes, you know, like uh, 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 creates the difference in the loss landscape. And there was some paper from the from the Los Alamos group also related to control theory and all. So right. like, so could those you are just, yeah. Yeah. So I'll explain some of the differences. I didn't have a chance to read those more in depth because they're very recent. But from what I understand, the Shaudi Wu paper looks at, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong. They look at uh, like generative models if you're training on some uh, training set. And there, I mean, and here we'll also see that interference does play a role um, and it ends up determining this like degree of freedom parameter that effectively is like the size of these unitaries, but it's actually different. Um, and it comes from how many things are getting summed in this like path integral formulation. So yeah, I think there is some relation, but I don't fully understand and they're in slightly different contexts. Um, so, yeah, I haven't had a chance to read that paper. Um, and, and then the Los Alamos paper is looking at um, essentially the dimension of uh, like the, the Lie algebra of all of the things you're evolving under, which essentially gives um, the effective dimension of the space you're exploring, yeah. uh, if that makes sense. So there is a similar... Um, intuition as far as I understand where if you if you're not evolving under like every possible operator you're only exploring some subspace of Hilbert space and that has some effective dimension and then that gives this degree of parameterization where if you have more parameters than this effective dimension then you're in the over parameterized regime so here I'm speaking in a very general sense where generally if you had like complete freedom in the space you're exploring then it's like a two to the end by two to the n dimensional space. And you'll be under parameterized if you have fewer parameters than that. Oh, um, so it's conceptually similar, but it's different. And also, I think that Los Alamos paper looks at something slightly different where they, um, they're not necessarily looking at uh, local minima, but also they're looking more generally at critical points, nice. um, as far as I understand. But uh, I could be confused. Okay. Also, you know, like I think, thanks for a very nice explanation. Like uh, I mean, I'm, and I like you know, really like this is quite interesting. Just to you know, like uh, and like you know, bring one more point to the like you know discussion. So, uh, so basically, what you're suggesting that you know, like you have these big unit trees which are you know like getting multiplied and all, but the number of knobs that we are you know like tuning that's very small. So basically, yeah. you know, the, the number of knobs is small, but you know, like the objects, they are, you know, like in a, in a very big dimensional space. And uh, somehow, you know, like, we're, like we are not able to, you know, like uh, in some sense, you know, like control in a manner that, you know, like by, by tuning these knobs, like we achieve the desired outcome. So, so, I, so I was wondering that, you know, like uh, it's more like uh, the object which connects what you are tuning in your parameter space and what's happening in the state of space of quantum states is this Fisher information, right? I mean, I can, I can, mm -hmm. uh, I, so like, uh, does that what, play a role uh, in your, uh, your uh, result? So not in, not in my analysis, but that's what, that's the approach the Los Alamos group takes is they look at the Fisher information. Okay, so um, I, I see, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say something else, <laughs> which I forget. Uh, oh, right, right, right. I, I just want to clarify a point, and I think you um, understand it, but just to make it more clear, this isn't an expressivity question. So even though we don't have that many knobs for a very large unitary that we're trying to control, we're just going to assume that, well, we don't, we don't actually need to assume in our proof, but 
conceptually, you can assume that these knobs, uh, there is some correct setting of the knobs to get you to the correct unitary. Uh -huh. um, so these phase transitions occur even when the, the unitary you're trying to learn is expressible by your onsets. So you assume that your knobs, there is some setting of the knobs that gives you the correct unitary. It's, the problem is finding the correct setting of the knobs is very difficult if you don't have that many knobs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. so, yeah, that's a, also a key point to realize. Okay, one final point, and after that, I will shut up, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah. So, you know, like, uh, this is a very, I mean, like, oh, recently, like, all very nice papers were coming. Like, one, and one of the papers was, you know, related to this like, uh, training by additional quantum algorithm is NP hard. And, uh, and they are the authors basically point out, you know, like, two kind of errors that, you know, one, that there's a possibility that, you know, the answer does not belong to your, uh, your onsite space. And uh, uh -huh. and there is another issue that you know, like even if it belongs, there it's difficult to find. So that you know, like, and what you are suggesting that you know is the is the case where you know, like, the answer belongs in the optimization space, but it's difficult to find. And uh, and they like you know provided this worst case kind of you know like analysis by mapping it to uh, like you know continuous version of the set problem. Uh, right. You are basically suggesting it. You know, like you are you are coming, but coming up with. Uh, a phase transition in the landscape, which kind of agrees with their result, you know, like uh, corresponding to the worst case scenario in the sense that uh, uh, like the training will be difficult and hence, you know, like it will be difficult to find. Uh, yeah, answer. except for them, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't looked at that paper in a while, but for them, they construct an instance, which is the worst case instance, and then show it's equivalent to the SAT problem. Here, we're going to look at not completely general problem Hamiltonians, but like completely general Hamiltonians that are physical in some sense. So they they have a reasonable poly decomposition. Um, so in some sense, you can think of this as like an average case hardness at shallow depth. Um, I mean, there's a lot of quotation marks around that statement, but uh, that's like one way to think about this result. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Okay, hopefully that answered your questions. Any more questions before we move on to the actual proof stuff? Not from me, okay. Okay. Cool, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going then. All right, so we have, uh, right, so we, we've shown that um, in classical machine learning, it's really nice. So let me, let me say how it can be bad in variational algorithms. Um, and at a very, very high level, we'll take a similar approach to the proof where we're going to look at um, these variational algorithms as random fields um, and essentially show that it can be mapped to a random field that, though never before like looked at, as far as I know, um, is pretty mathematically convenient to work with. And then we'll, we'll work with that mathematically convenient random field and show what the local minima look like for it, OK? So this is the very high level overview of the proof. Um, so let me, let me talk about assumptions for a second. So we're going to consider a class of onsatses where we start in an arbitrary stabilizer state, and then we're rotating under random poly uh, matrices. So obviously, this isn't what we do in practice. We don't. Uh, completely randomly choose an onset at the beginning of our optimization. Um, but uh, essentially what this is, is it's a mathematically convenient way for us to completely decouple the onsets from the problem Hamiltonian. So we're essentially looking at onsets that have no relation at all to the problem we're interested in. Okay. So Q is going to be the number of poly evolutions we do. Um, but often, I think someone mentioned this earlier, um, parameters will repeat throughout a circuit or be tied together. So P is the number of independent parameters for the circuit. And we'll actually find that P is the important parameter, less so Q. Um, so P is what we should be thinking about when we think of depth in terms of parameterization. Okay. And as I mentioned previously, we're going to consider a physical H and 
the full assumptions are in the paper, but essentially it's that H isn't doesn't have a ridiculous poly decomposition. Um, so this is its poly decomposition. And just to make this presentation go more smoothly, I'm just going to assume it's traceless. Um, but it doesn't actually change anything. It just shifts the landscape. OK. Oh, and the ground state energy is lambda 1. Uh, OK, so I think I've said the whole setup. Um, and now we're going to look at this uh, VQA loss function. So uh, this is the normal loss function, except just to make it more convenient to work with, we're normalizing out the energy and then shifting the landscape up so it's always positive. OK, obviously, you can't train on this in practice because you don't know what lambda 1 is. Otherwise, you'd be done. But um, you know, in terms of studying the landscape, it's the same landscape except shifted and unitless. Um, and note that this is already a random field because the, the onset state we chose, we just randomly pick it. Um, so because it's a random choice, uh, this is a random function on the torus because these data are governing polyevolutions. So they're all periodic. So this is a random field on a torus. But uh, this is a little unwieldy to work with, as you might imagine. So the first thing we're going to do is show that it has a more mathematically convenient form. OK. So what do we show? We show that this uh, VQA loss function in the limit of many qubits looks like this random field, which looks similar to the Gaussian one I showed for neural networks. But there's a couple of key differences. It's on the torus. These parameters are on the torus. And this J is now a Weishart well, normalized Weishart random matrix. So I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, but up to that, are there any questions on what we're trying to do here? We're essentially writing the VQA loss function in a less quantum mechanical way or less physics -y way and making it more a math problem. Uh, so basically earlier, like, I mean, uh, so, okay, I mean, I, I, it's like a, a very nice, you know, like the way you're presenting the stuff, like it's, it's very, yeah, like, so, so earlier you, like you were talking about like neural network loss function and, uh -huh. uh, and there you had, you know, like uh, this, uh, uh, it's random, uh, you know, like a V shot uh, random field, like you know, description, and uh, so so in the previous case you mentioned that it's on a it's on a uh, surface a surface of the like you can map it to a surface of a sphere, right? Yeah. And here, so, in this case, you are able to map it to a, a surface of a hyper torus. Right. So in the sphere case, that comes about because for a neural network. Well, generally your parameters are in Rn, but that's difficult to work with. So for those papers, they assume you have some uh, L2 normalization on your parameters. Um, so all your parameters are on the sphere. Here, we don't even have to do any assumptions. They just naturally live on the torus because uh, we're doing poly evolutions. Mm -hmm. So it's periodic. So each parameter is you know between minus pi and pi. Uh, maybe up to a factor of two. So. Uh, uh, but a torus is, a, a torus is not homeomorphic to a sphere. So like uh, is, is like. Right, a, so it's different. Of, so is the part of the reason, like, you know, we, I mean, we will see some difference is because of the underlying nature of the, I mean, the, the, the manifold. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. So this is, Good, good. Yeah, this is like a, this is essentially related to this underparameterization thing. So, right, we're on the torus. And because we're on the torus, um, in particular, we're on this like strange embedding of the torus in uh, two to the p Euclidean space. So, it's like a strange embedding of the torus. And um, it's a very like, underparameterized embedding of the torus. And uh, in a certain regime, that doesn't matter so much. And in a different regime, it matters. And that depends on the details of this Weishart matrix. So I'll get into that now, like what this Weishart matrix is. 
Um, uh, one more question, sorry. So, yeah, yeah. but you know, like I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, like maybe it does not matter, but I'm, I'm thinking that, okay, so no matter, you know, like what manifold you have, like uh, locally, like, you know, I mean, it's, you can always map it. I mean, by definition, it's isomorphic to, in, sorry, by it's homeomorphic to Rn, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so like, I mean, uh, I mean, all the gradient updates for everything you are just interested in, you know, like, uh, uh, like, I mean, everything is local, right? I mean, uh, so, so maybe it's, maybe this question does not make sense or something, but I'm thinking that why does, why does the global nature, I mean, I mean, why does the overall topology matters while, yeah. all, all, while all the updates are, you know, like the local in nature. So like, I mean, locally so, and uh, both are same, right? Uh, a sphere. Right, right, right. So it's less the, uh, it, it's more the um, global embedding and like the dimension of this embedded, uh, like the, the full space that's being embedded into. But it's really that in combination with the Weishaupt matrix. Like, I guess to put it a different way, if you had a Gaussian model on a hypertorus, mm -hmm. you would, my guess is you would see the same behavior as, uh, the Gaussian model on the sphere. Like, I, I think it's it's somewhat dependent on the fact that it's on a torus because we're doing all of our calculations um, with like this two to the P here instead of P, but it's it's mainly a function of the, the Weishaupt matrix. Um, nice. And the, the reason the torus comes in is that when we look at derivatives, um, being on a torus ends up making the Hessian look nice um, in a certain way. And I'm not positive it would look like this if it were on a sphere. You bring up a good point that locally it looks the same. So they might just look the same, but um, yeah. I see. So, okay. Again, final question after that, you know, like- Yeah, yeah no problem, no problem. So, so here, it's good to uh, understand. Yeah, so you have like, you know, you have the, basically this hyper torus, basically, you know, basically you have this P copies of S1 and you know, like, and that, yeah. that's how you have this hyper torus. Uh, in the earlier case, you had you had a P sphere or like, or do you take take a P prime sphere? Like, I mean, does the value of P remain same? Oh, oh it's the same in both cases. Like, uh, yeah, so the P sphere or uh, P minus one sphere or whatever, uh -huh. in the, the machine learning case, their P is the number of parameters. And here P is the number of parameters when we take S1 to the P. Ah. So, so they end up being the same. If you look at them as just mathematical models, you know, there's no reason that the dimensions of the spaces they're on are related in any way. But yeah, if you look at how both of them are mapped for the uh, neural network, it's the number of parameters is P, it's the P sphere or P minus one sphere. And then here uh, it's the, uh, you know, P torus, depending on how you define P torus. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Cool. So we have our mapping. Great. Um, so yeah, let me explain what a Weishaupt matrix is because uh, they're not as common as Gaussian matrices. Um, essentially, if you have an n by m complex Gaussian matrix, the square effectively of that matrix is. Um, Weissart are distributed. And the important parameter is this M. This is the number of columns of this matrix. And uh, I think it's generally called this, I, know I at least call it the degrees of freedom parameter. So effectively, if you look at this matrix multiplication, it's like the number of squared Gaussians that are being summed uh, in the matrix multiplication. And if you, if you know what a gamma distribution is or a chi-squared distribution, it's effectively the matrix version of that. Um, so gamma distribution with m degrees of freedom is centered at m and has width uh, root m. So when you normalize it by m, its mean is at one and its width is like one over root m. So think of a Weishaupt matrix with these parameters as being the matrix version of that. Okay. And yeah, this m parameter will be very important later. Um, so. Yeah, okay. So just very quickly before we move on, uh, let me say how you show this correspondence. Um, essentially, you look at the path integral expansion 
And uh, this is where this interference can come into play uh, to answer your question, uh, Kishore. So uh, you look at this path integral expansion and what you can do is show that these paths, if you take them to be independent, um, you don't lose that much in error essentially by making this assumption. Uh, and then once you assume these are all independent, it's pretty straightforward to show that this looks like a Weizart uh, random matrix. Okay. So, um, right. And where like this uh, M degrees of freedom comes from is the fact that you're summing over um, effectively like M things in this path. So it, it slightly depends on the spectrum of H, but these are details that you can ask me at the end of the talk or something, but that's the general idea. Okay, great. So we have uh, in the machine learning case, we have this Gaussian field on a sphere. And in the VQE case, we have this Weizsart field on a torus. So what's so different about them? Like why does it matter that one's on a sphere, one's on a torus and one's Gaussian and one's Weissart. So the important part really comes from the spectral distribution of Gaussian matrices and Weissart matrices. Um, and the fact that Weissart matrices experience kind of a phase transition uh, in their spectral, like spectral behavior. So just as a general fact, independent of what I've said up to this point, if you have a D by D Gaussian matrix, its eigenvalues spread a pretty wide uh, range um, without going into too many details. It, you know, it follows this uh, semicircle law. But a Weizsart matrix, when its um, degrees of freedom parameter is very large, then all of its eigenvalues are concentrated at one. But when uh, D starts to be greater than M, you start getting these zero eigenvalues because it's not full rank anymore. Um, and so your spectral behavior changes as D crosses M. Okay. Uh, so you can already see the beginnings of where a phase transition might come in. It'll turn out the Hessian has a Weizsart term in it because we're looking at Weizsart random fields. And this is what leads to this phase transition. Um, okay, so what's M? M, as you can see, is very important. And if you go through this whole mapping procedure, it's effectively two to the n. Assuming your Hamiltonian isn't crazy, uh, it's like on the order of two to the n. So I should say here that this whole proof and where you get this m comes from this uh, Hamiltonian agnostic ansatz we consider. But if you go through the proof and you assume you have a an ansatz that depends on your problem Hamiltonian, there are heuristic reasons to believe that M can be much smaller. Um, and it essentially comes back to this fact that I mentioned very briefly, where effectively the number of terms you're summing here is like M. But if different uh, paths have different weights that depend on your problem Hamiltonian, you can make this much smaller in principle. So. M for this ansatz is very large, but in principle for a Hamiltonian dependent ansatz, it can be much smaller. So Eric, like, uh, yeah. uh, I'm wondering, you know, like, uh, so like, I mean, basically in both cases, you are looking at, you know, the matrix of the loss function, right? You are mapping it uh, like uh, to a Wishart field or, you know, like, uh, yeah, or to a Gaussian field. And then uh, trying to look at, you know, like uh, basically it's rank. But I'm, I'm thinking that normally when we do the training, like you know, we are interested in the in the in the gradients, right? Uh, yeah. Like, so so why are we like uh, uh, I mean, why are we looking at the rank of the loss function and not the? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's kind of misleading that I put this here uh, instead of later in the talk. But the Hessian, it'll turn out, has a Weishart term, uh -huh. and. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what matters. I see, I see. Oh, I see. So that has a phase transition. Oh, so 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 then it makes sense, you know. Like I mean, Hessian is kind of related to the you know quantum Fisher information, right? So in some sense, yeah, I, in some sense you are looking at the rank of the quantum Fisher information matrix. 
I think there is some relation, but um, yeah, I haven't probed deeply into that, you know, and as you mentioned, there is some like interference effect going on here. So there's probably some relation. I just am unaware of it because <laughs> I haven't had a chance to read through the papers more closely, but yeah, you know, this is, I think they're all, all these papers are different ways of saying similar things um, that have an underlying similarity. Um, okay, cool. So we did the first half. We showed that these uh, variational algorithms look like random fields. Uh, so now it's just up to showing what the local minima look like. And at this point, it's essentially no more physics, it's all math. Um, but hopefully I can give some mathematical intuition as to how this part of the proof works. Okay, so the, the main tool we're gonna use is something called the Katz-Rice formula. Um, and it looks complicated, but this is essentially just some technique from Morse theory that allows you to look at the expected number of local minima at various energies for a random field. So if you are looking at this, the expected number of local minima below a certain energy, effectively it's just given by averaging over your surface, this Jacobian factor, which is determinant of your Hessian, uh, times all these conditionals at being at the correct local minima and the correct energy, times the density of critical points. Um, because generally you're on a manifold, all these derivatives are covariant, but because uh, we're on a Euclidean hypertorus, it doesn't actually matter. But um, yeah, so the takeaway from all this is that if you know what the Hessian and gradient and function value are all distributed as, you can just calculate this in principle. So, um, right, that's what I say here. And just to give a very quick example, in the machine learning case, everything is Gaussian and it's really nice because uh, the derivatives are Gaussian and everything. And the um, spectral distribution of your Hessian is because the Hessian is Gaussian, we know it's the semicircle law. And there's a shift by the function value, it turns out. So at higher and higher energies, this shifts and then it stops being positive definite. So at this point, that Jacobian factor is zero. So this says that there are no more local minima after this energy. So all local minima are banded close to the global minimum. And even better, because this distribution is so wide, the spectral distribution is so wide, the uh, Jacobian factor decreases very rapidly. So effectively, the largest contribution is here uh, at low energies. So if you just put everything together in the neural network case, your local minimum minima distribution looks something like this, uh, up to subleading stuff, but something like this, okay? So, and the width of this is like one over root P. So this is how you get this root P convergence. Are there any questions about what are the conceptually? Axes? Yeah. What, what are the axes and the axes? Uh, they're, they're kind of arbitrary. I just wanted to plot what it looked like vaguely. Um, so the x-axis here is like the uh, function value you're looking at. And then the y-axis is the density of local minima. So all of your local minima are concentrated at low function values. And then it decreases very rapidly. And then there's some cutoff. But the cutoff doesn't even matter because it decreases so rapidly, it effectively doesn't even play a role. OK. So that's the classical neural network case. What about the Weishart case? So, you know, like, uh, sorry, like, oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I don't think, I, I'm not sure whether I understand, but, but there was this result in classical machine learning, which was used by, you know, like, uh, uh, people at Caltech, like I think Robert Huang and others, and where this, I mean, basically this paper, like the power of quantum neural networks, where uh, uh, they, I mean, they use this idea that, you know, like if you have a, a high depth neural network, then you can, you know, like uh, you can um, kind of uh, relate it to, uh, you, I mean, basically training is same as, you know, basically training in a cardinal method. And, uh, and, uh, I'm wondering, you know, like, because like uh, somehow as you increase number of parameters, the landscape effectively becomes overall convex. 
So yeah, so like so, it kind of like you know, kind of think of it, you know, like one way to like you know, agreement of you know, like uh, the the uh, the plot that you have and and uh, and this result about you know, in the classical machine learning that for high depth, it's it's basically just a convex landscape. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's essentially what this result shows. It use it uses different methods. It doesn't go into kernel methods or anything, but. Um, Essentially, it's, it uses random matrix theory techniques to show that, yeah, effectively it looks convex because all of your local minima are close to the global minimum. So it might be bumpy at the bottom, but overall it looks kind of convex. Okay. So yeah, that's neural networks. That's why they're so nice and uh, easy to train. So what about Weishart uh, random fields? So yeah, you can ignore all the words essentially. The important part is equation 14, which is what the Hessian distribution looks like at a function value x. So once again, we have a Gaussian term that's shifted by the function value, but now we have a Weishart term here. Um, and this is what, and in fact, uh, it turns out this dominates this term. So effectively it's just a shifted Weishart term. And this will completely change everything effectively. <laughs> And make it much worse. Um, and yeah, once again, the Gaussian, the gradient actually normally distributed, finally enough. Okay. So it turns out using random matrix theory techniques I won't go into, you can look at the eigenvalue distribution of the Hessian um, in the large size limit. There are some technicalities though, because this Jacobian factor is exponentially sensitive to deviations in uh, this convergence. So even if there is some exponentially unlikely uh, of, like matrix choice that um, shifts this spectral distribution by a lot, it can contribute to the expectation value over Hessian. Um, so you have to like control all these deviations, but it turns out you can do all this and it all works out. <laughs> I won't go into the details, but it all works out. Um, so what do you get? So you get, uh, so I'm just gonna try and give a picture proof of what happens, assuming we know what the Hessian distribution looks like using these uh, techniques. So on the top is the, uh, the Gaussian situation. So we have a very wide, uh, spectral distribution. And so the Jacobian decreases very rapidly and we get this band. For a Weizart random field, it turns out the width of this is like one over M. So it's exponentially small. Um, and so at, once again, at some high enough energy, this will stop being positive definite. But because this is so narrow, this energy is so large, it effectively doesn't play a role. So effectively it doesn't have this banded behavior. I mean, it technically does, but the band is very trivial. Um, and even worse, this is so narrow that the um, Jacobian factor decreases very slowly. So no longer is the largest contribution at, well, the largest contribution for the Jacobian part is still at uh, F equals zero, but it barely changes as we look at higher and higher energies, if that makes sense. So, we can put all this together, you know, calculate everything. And again, up to some subleading terms and just very generally, effectively the local minima distribution looks like a beta distribution that's very skewed. Um, so it looks like this. So the peak width here is one over M. So this is exponentially narrow. And uh, when, P in the limit that P is zero, this is centered at half the mean eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So when you have very few parameters, all of your local minima are at half the mean eigenvalue. And generally they're proportional to one minus P over two M. Um, and because this is exponentially narrow, uh, you'll essentially very rapidly get a shift of being in a bad regime. And then suddenly when P is on the order of M, or 2m, you'll get um, you'll get local minima at the global minimum. Okay, does this make sense? So we have this like beta distribution that, for any reasonable p, is going to be at half the mean eigenvalue. 
So effectively, we have this order parameter. I put it in quotation marks because I'm not a condensed matter theorist. So I don't think I have the credentials to call things order parameters. But we have effectively an order parameter that's um, the number of parameters for your model um, over 2m. And again, m is for at least these Hamiltonian agnostic ansatzes that we consider, m is exponentially large in n. So this is almost always very small in any reasonable case. And when it's much smaller than one, this essentially says that all of your local minima are at half the mean eigenvalue. And then when gamma is at least one, then all of your local minima are at the global minima. Okay? So this is analytically showing this phase transition in the local minima distribution. Um, okay. Are there any questions? Can I, yeah, can I ask <laughs> I know I went to the, that, Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my question might sound a bit silly, but the, 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 my idea is, if, if you're in the underparameterized case, then all our eigenvalues are half the mean eigenvalue, right? Then can't we just take mm -hmm. the eigenvalue and multiply that by two? Then like that, we will know what the, what the mean eigenvalue is. Yeah, well, so here we don't know what the shift is. Like every, uh, this, if you remember back at the beginning, we've like shifted the spectral uh, spectrum and then scaled by the minimum eigenvalue. So we don't know what, like the shift is and what the scaling is. Um, we just know that we're far away when we restore all the units and stuff. Um, so yeah. Right, right, okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Also, I think, you know, just knowing that what is the mean eigenvalue that does not give you information about uh, uh, the smallest eigenvalue, right? Because right, I mean, yeah, it depends exactly. on the eigenvalue distribution. So. Uh, so yeah, like you know the mean eigenvalue, but you know it's like, I mean, it, it, we don't know how, how how what is the variance of the local, you know, the loss function and all those details, right? Yeah, exactly. And because here we've normalized by all of that, uh, in principle you can figure it out, but you can't normalize by all of this a priori because then you would have solved the problem. So, yeah. Um, right. Any other questions about this? I have a question, you know, like, uh, yeah. related to this. So, so yeah, like this answer, like uh, we got like, you know, in, uh, for uh, Hamiltonian agnostic concepts, right? So yeah. almost no information goes, but uh, but then, you know, like, I mean, do you think like it will be very difficult to, let's say, uh, calculate, uh, like what have you already calculated at least for QA way? I mean, where, at least yeah, so I haven't calculated M because the proof technically doesn't go through for things like QAOA. So just going all the way back here. So yeah, in this proof, you have to like have these randomly chosen polys. Uh, and then you um, do the sum and then you get effectively exponentially degree, many degrees of freedom. My guess is for things like QAOA, we'll see numerically later that it looks nice, the landscape, relatively. Um, my guess is that effectively you're reweighting. So you can think of H as having like exponentially many eigenvalues. And some are more important than others because some have a larger magnitude than others. But when your Q depend on your problem, you can effectively reweigh these to um, only explore the, like, to put more weight on the eigenvalues that matter. So like the, the small eigenvalues, essentially. Um, so my guess is that's what happens in QAOA. But the M that you get from just doing this, because this answer comes from the Hamiltonian agnostic case. This is way too pessimistic for things like QAOA, as we'll see. Um, like really, it's way smaller because of, this fact that you're reweighing the spectrum effectively. It's hard to say without going into too many details, but that's like, I, I think that for these Hamiltonian dependent ansatzes, similar results hold, but M is much more reasonable, is my guess. Okay. Cool. So yeah, let me, let me talk about numerics very, very briefly. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, like this whole 
thing was inspired by numerics. We've seen that this phase transition occurs numerically already. Um, so here I just wanted to see really if they concentrated at half the mean eigenvalue. Um, and again, up to the scaling and shift. And indeed they do. So these uh, dashed lines are uh, just because we're at finite n. n here is only eight. So this isn't even like in the asymptotic limit really, but it still kind of seems to hold. Um, and this is a histogram of local minima at various energies uh, for different depths. So yeah, they're all concentrated at half the mean eigenvalue because in these units, uh, that's at one half. So it looks really bad, but as I just mentioned, um, it's probably better for Hamiltonian based on Sotsis. Um, so this is uh, essentially QAOA, but for the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, yeah, I should say this was for the Fermi Hubbard model, um, finding the ground state energy. Um, so you can you have like a QAOA kind of circuit for the Fermi Hubbard model, and then you get much better performance than this exponentially large M would predict. So um, effectively, this says that if, if this Weishart random field is a good model for these ansatzes as well, then M is much smaller than this exponentially large N. So this is sort of what people had already seen in previous numerics, that this transition seems to occur at like much more reasonable depths. OK. So that, that's everything. We showed that these, Hamil these shallow Hamiltonian agnostic ansatzes are also difficult to train, not just the deep ones. Um, so essentially move to Hamiltonian based ansatzes is the, <laughs> the key point. Um, Hamiltonian agnostic ansatzes seem uh, impossible to train essentially. Uh, and ideally we'd be able to prove more things about these Hamiltonian based ansatzes. And we have like heuristic understandings, but um, you know, nothing beats a proof. So ideally we'd be able to prove something about them. Uh, and I, if you notice closely, everything we proved was an expectation. So it'd be nice to also prove this local minima density and distribution as well, uh, which I think is possible. It just requires more calculation. Um, and numerically we see it's true. And then ideally, we'd also look at other loss functions to evaluate things like quantum generative modeling. Um, and I've taken some initial steps in this direction, looking at uh, quantum Boltzmann machines. So feel free to ask me about that. But that's it. So thanks for having me. Are there any questions? Can we can I ask? Yeah, go for it. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, very nice talk. You know, like I mean, thank actually, you. Actually, like you know, wow. Well, but people in our group were like, you know, very interested, like, you know, when we saw that paper and, you know, like, uh, yeah, like, so, so thanks, like, you know, for nice talk. Um, Hopefully it makes more sense now. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, like, uh, um, so basically the hardware, hardware efficient ansatz for all practical purposes are very low, right? I mean, I mean, all those, uh, there were this barren plateau result because why you this barren plateau and, you know, like, and many of these results in the project, like for uh, they, I mean, they are uh, basically for the hard. I mean, the uh, uh, your result kind of you know like uh, analytically says that if you have hard very interesting ansatz, for example, uh, it will be very very difficult to train, like unless you have too many parameters. Which in that case, you know, like there is no need to train because there are too many parameters. So so yeah, like what I'm wondering that uh, like. You are looking at basically, you know, like uh, I assume, like though, like you know, I I'm not sure whether I exactly followed, but you are looking at the Hessian, right? And and through Hessian, uh, like uh, looking at the eigenvalues of the Hessian, you are trying to, you know, like infer results and all. I am wondering that what if you know, like if somebody uses metric aware optimization, so something like you know, use a quantum natural gradient, you know, like. Uh, those kind of approaches where you use information of, you know, like, I mean, do I understand you know, what that I mean, you know, the result from Los Alamos group that uh, the cases in which you have barren plateau to, uh, 
to to estimate uh, the the second derivative, the number of you know like the the basically shots that you have to take that will scale exponentially. So so yeah, I mean uh, what I'm wondering that let's say you know like somebody gives or there is some oracle which gives you you know like uh, the the uh, basically the uh, this natural grade or something. Yeah. So in that case, like you know, like does the result still hold in the case of metric aware, you know, like optimization? That's a great question, and is in the last bullet point. <laughs> I have no idea, and oh, I okay. want to understand. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so th this is one example, um, and then even just completely different applications. Like if you're training on the relative entropy. And you have Oracle access to the state you're interested in. Uh -huh. um, uh, like, do similar results hold? Um, yeah. So stuff like that, I'm very interested in. And I started less so on the metric aware optimization, but on the uh, access to the state you're interested in direction, um, training quantum Boltzmann machines, which are a generative model for quantum states. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think I think. Uh, um, yeah, like Nathan, Nathan, we've had this thing, right? That that using, uh, yeah, like uh, this range, yeah, like uh, I mean, yeah, so like uh, different optimization strategies might, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, of... different uh, problems um, that have similar overarching techniques. And I, I think quantum Boltzmann machines, you can get. Uh, I mean, I haven't fully proven it, but it seems that it has a good loss landscape and it's similar to restricted Boltzmann machines, um, which also have a good loss landscape. So I think, um, yeah, it's not just immediately, oh, all quantum onslaughts are bad. It's, you know, you just have to be careful. I think it's the moral of this talk. I see, I see, yeah, beautiful, thanks. No problem. Any other questions? So you mentioned that the main point of difference is the non-linearities, right? So like quantum systems have no non-linearities, that's maybe one of the issues. So that's one point of difference. I wouldn't say that's the main point of difference. Mm. Um, so the way we deal with this uh, non-linearity, lack of non-linearity, is we directly look at a randomized onslaught. So effectively, we don't, uh, essentially what this, means is that we can't rely on nonlinearities to give us effective Gaussian couplings. We mm -hmm. have to look at the nature of, in our case, the path integral. And essentially, you're summing a bunch of uh, IID like paths. And that effectively gives you this Weissart distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're not actually IID, but uh, you can pretend they are up to some minimal loss and error. Um, yeah. So, so it's not so a in, problem. So because I was wondering, like, because convolution networks don't have the barren plateau problem. So, and I think they have lots of non-linearities, right? I think you do some intermittent measurements and something like that. Yeah, so not for mistaken. them. So that's uh, like a non-linearity, right? So is that maybe? I, I would imagine, quite, I mean, I, this doesn't apply to, the, to that situation because mm -hmm. of that and uh, just the nature of the onsets and the loss function. But my, I imagine that quantum convolutional neural networks have good uh, multiple minima, is my guess, because they are a very structured, like Mira kind of onsets. Uh, yeah. So, and classically, people train Mira for generative modeling. So my guess is quantum convolutional neural networks would also be OK. Um, I, I haven't proven anything, but that's just my guess. Um, because you looked only at, at pure states, right? But um, in this, yeah. many things are right there, mixed states. Right. So I'm wondering if you go everything to a super operator, uh, would there be any difference? That's a good question. Um, that noise or I don't know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess like a zeroth order approximation of this is you assume that your Hessian and gradient have like an additional normally distributed contribution or something from mm. noise. And then it wouldn't change these results, really. Um, 
I mean, I guess if the noise is large enough, it would be easy to train because it's effectively like constant. Uh, and so that's equivalent to saying that you have the dominating normal distribution here that completely washes out all of this stuff. Um, so, and same here. So I think there is a, you know, you can make some zeroth order approximation and say something about it, but so yeah, formally look at the super operator picture. I, I, I don't know, <laughs> that, that seems hard, uh, so. The structure is the answer. Can you maybe give uh, some interpretation of the M again? Because this M uh, is like some very physical explanation. Like some explanation for what? Sorry. Like high level explanation what M is like. Um, oh, M? The it's M effectively. Um, it's like explorable Hilbert yeah, space yeah. in some way. It's sort of that. It's like the. Um, the explorable Hilbert space weighted by uh, how important certain eigenvalues are. Again, going back to this uh, Feynman path integral, effectively the way that you show that this looks, I skipped a lot of steps obviously in this mm. one slide proof, but the first step to showing this mapping is to show that this looks like a sum of many Weizhardt random fields. And each of those Weizhardt random fields is proportional to um, the eigenvalues of H. Mm -hmm. So um, you have two to the N uh, Weizhardt random fields that you're summing. And if, uh, depending on the relative importance of these Weizhardt random fields, because they're all scaled differently, um, that gives you N. So if they were all of equal weight, if all the eigen, if each was the identity, then this would just be two to the n. Um, maybe with the lambda one squared for units, I forget, but it's a, it'll be two to the n. But because some are effectively much smaller than others, we get this um, this weighting. So, uh, yeah, that's like where it comes from is the sum of all of these Weizhardt random fields that are proportional to the eigenvalues of H. So that's another reason, or another way to see that I, I think it's important that for Hamiltonian uh, based ensembles, because so the weights, mm. relative weights of all these in the sum depend on the eigenvalues of H. If yeah. the Q also depend on the Hamiltonian, then you can also weigh it so that you're minimizing H by reweighing these eigenvalues. So this is why I think these Hamiltonian based ensembles work much better, or at least can work much better. Mm. Um, but that's hard to prove in a in a unconditional sense because you can't. It's hard to talk about like fixed H and fixed terms that are you know, in this path in a goal. You would have to look at like GOEH, but then that might not be a good model. Um, mm -hmm. So. Okay, okay. But yeah, the, I understand that's very intuitive. Okay, so that's some correlation between the eigenvalues and the answer. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes more clear. Yeah. Thank you. And if there are no other questions, then we can end here. Thanks, Eric, for coming again. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yeah, so, Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk.